course, the most important person in this field, and the one who's been most influential since then, is Immanuel Kant. Now, unlike the Stoics, however, Immanuel Kant offered a visual, a vision of cosmopolitanism that privileged reason over emotion, over imagination. He privileged logos over pathos. And this, of course, has, has um, opened up a big set of questions which I think people in the arts would be particularly attuned to. But somehow, in all the debates, even Derrida's account of cosmopolitanism have remained within the deliberative framework of reason that Kant established for discussion, that Kant first established when he redefined cosmopolitanism. Because unlike the Stoics who said that the, the power and empowering force of cosmopolitanism is love, is our ability to connect with others through and because of love, Kant says we connect through each other through reason. Now, this of course is a big discussion, but I think it's also a fundamental limit to the way in which we can understand cosmopolitanism today if we stay within the Kantian framework. And one person who I think did a great deal to break out of that Kantian framework and to reject the, the principles of, of intersubjectivity and social transformation was a, a, a Greek philosopher based in Paris called Cornelius Castoriadis. Now, I think smoking is a disgusting habit, but, um, but people look good in black and white when they smoke. So I chose this image. Now, Castoriadis. Um, was a strong critic of, of, of Kant. He never spoke directly to the concept of, of cosmopolitanism. In fact, I imagine him being quite dismissive of much of the discussion that has recently happened around cosmopolitanism. But he had, to, especially towards the end of his career, spent a great deal of time trying to understand creativity, trying to understand how change actually occurs. Because he says, in the beginning, all of existence is chaos, an abyss, the experience of groundlessness. How do we change? How do we create a form? How do we give something an identity through without some creative intervention that overcomes this experience of the abyss, of formlessness? And so he believes that all social institutions all cultural manifestations ultimately come from some radical act of the imagination. His classic example was, in fact, the democracy of Athens. How is it that in this city, at this particular time in history, surrounded by a sea of tyranny, itself only having previously experienced tyranny, suddenly decides to adopt a completely different model of social, political, human, cultural existence. How is it that every other city that was built in history, which had a palace as its focus, which inside that palace all the institutions of power were concentrated, suddenly we have a city that has no palace. There is no single emperor. There is no one ruler who controls from their house, the rule of law. And his explanation for this, and every other instance, is that it comes from some radical act of the imagination, which he calls the imaginary. So all social institutions can only be viable because they articulate this fundamental act of an imagination. And it's through identification with and embodiment of these institutions through identification that these institutions are viable in any sense. Now, what underpins this act of the imagination is a strong sense of the autonomy of the individual, the individual's capacity to imagine something else, not just to be 
uh, carrier of ideas that have been passed on to them, because that will keep us in the, in the sphere of tyranny, that will keep us in the closed notion of tradition. If we are to break out of it, we must have this capacity for autonomy. However, he is also astutely aware of the fact that while humans have this capacity for autonomy, the institutions, rather than fostering and fermenting this ability to think freely, to imagine otherwise, to present alternatives to the given, the, the here and now, the institutions effectively act as a kind of closure, a wall that closes in and keeps people with preventing, prevents people from actually doing what they're actually capable of. So he has, has many scathing things to say about why we prefer racism rather than humanism, why the people are more likely to be um, racist rather than anthropo-humanists, um, why people are more conformists than, than autonomists, etc. So, but he actually still holds on to the belief that we have this capacity to imagine what is human for all. And so this capacity, this potential, he argues, comes from this act of the imagination, the radical imagination. So, <clears throat> by the definition, therefore, what I would argue is that through this capacity for imagination, we can also reground a different notion of cosmopolitanism a different way of thinking about where we meet and how we can be together and how we belong and what is common and different. So I will try and um, unpack some of these ideas that I've put forward about cosmopolitanism and the radical act of the imagination by now looking more closely at these five tendencies that I believe are, are, are certainly significant in contemporary artistic practices. The first of these five tendencies is of course what I describe as this act of denationalization. Marcel Duchamp, of course we famously know, took great pleasure in, in, in a way in, his, in the fact that he had to leave home, his home in Paris. He said towards the end of his life, it enabled him to quote unquote swim freely and this idea, I think, is very pertinent to many of the discussions and many ideas of the subjectivity of the artists in the modern period. This idea that they can eliminate, withdraw, subtract from themselves the pressures, the expectations, the influences that otherwise accumulate if you're a stay-at-home type person. However, it's not just that you allow, it allows you to shed certain things from your past or to choose what you want to carry with you. But it also produces what an Indian scholar calls a worldview as angularity. In other words, it gives you a different kind of perspective on what is possible and what is desirable in the world. And through this inner experience of exile, there is a new kind of sense of what the home could be. A number of other artists have also talked about hospitality as another important tendency. In art. And there's two ways to think about this idea of hospitality. Daniel Birnbaum has a very interesting interpretation of this. He sees in works like Oliver Elias and a hospitality that comes from reflexivity. That is, the way in which the artwork starts to see you rather than you just seeing it. How it incorporates this, the perspective of the viewer into the action of the work itself and how this peculiar inversion takes place where you are being seen by the work. This, I think, is a very interesting interpretation of, of the idea of reflexive hospitality. Perhaps a more uh, straightforward idea of hospitality is the one that's often articulated by numerous collectives that have been um, organised in the last decade or so, which have campaigned um, for, for the human rights of refugees and migrants. One like Fadait, temporary no border media laboratories, which have organised what they call mirror spaces that reflect the transnational movements of people and extend the ideas of human rights and the obligations that we have towards each other. 
The third tendency that I think is very significant around this debate about cosmopolitanism is the idea of cultural translation. How we make sense of what is different, how we incorporate it into our everyday life. Now, let me read to you a quote about the, the dilemmas often articulated when cultural translation um, is put forward as, a, as an issue in contemporary practice, and how the codes for making sense of the specific in the universal or the cultural, or one context in the cultural in another context is often producing gaps or misunderstandings, or as we often say, lost in translation. And this is a um, nice little quote from Shirin Nesha, as it says, At one moment I am dealing with Iranians who know the sources of my material, and then I am dealing with an audience who has no clue. To me they both have their advantages and disadvantages. With Iranians I can never fulfill their expectations because I am an outsider. With foreigners I can never fulfill their expectations because I am an Iranian, and they are Western. And I can never really break down the cultural context of the work. Now, this in a sense shows how this process of cultural translation is often understood as a, as a sort of battle between the local and the, and, the, and the global, the particular and the general, and the irreducibility of one or the other, or the, mis the impossibility of the making sense of one in the context of the other. That, I think, is a familiar and important aspect of the way we understand cultural translation. However, I want to also put forward an additional understanding of cultural translation, one that comes out of an, a Japanese-American scholar called Naoki Sakai, understanding of translation when he says that translation isn't just the problem of making sense of the particular in the general, the translation is the necessity to invent a new addressee. What Sakai actually says is translation actually starts when no one understands you. <laughs> and that I think is the most interesting part of that, is that you have to invent the ground upon which the person that you are speaking to can actually start to grasp what you are talking about. So the dilemma that Shirin Nesha quite actually and accurately described is not the problem of translation, it's the necessary starting point of cultural translation. Through cultural translation, we invent an audience, we produce a community through the act of missing as we actually aim to get to the other person. And this constant desire to sort of reach to the other person, to make sense of something that's foreign to the other person, to try and internalize other ideas has produced what many people call the discursive term. 